good morning, everyone. I'd like to, those who especially are here in the sanctuary this morning, I want to welcome you to our First Presbyterian Church Masquerade Party. <laughs> we welcome all of you who are here and those of you who are at home joining us this morning online. We welcome you and we pray that God will speak to you this morning during this time of worship wherever you are seated today. A few announcements to bring to your attention. In our news and notes, we've been um, publishing a little survey for you all to take. I think we've had 30-some or so that have responded back, and we'd like to get those wrapped up, taken care of, so that we can get an idea of, of uh, some of the obstacles that we might be able to control or do something about that would uh, help people feel comfortable in coming back to worship. So if you could finish that up and send it in to us, we would appreciate that. For those of you who are, who are, at, are at home this morning, uh, if uh, this is a communion Sunday, so if you want to run to the kitchen and get some bread and juice uh, for that part of the service a little bit later, we would uh, ask you to do so. Uh, let's see. I want to thank Mark Wisely for filling in for Larry Grab. His, uh, Larry Grab's name is uh, the lay leader this morning, but Larry is under the weather a little bit today. So uh, thank you, Mark, for filling in. Let's see, what else? Oh, next week you will have um, Reverend Stan Johnson will be here to bring the message to you. And uh, we will, Cheryl is going to be gone as well, but um, you will have, let's see, it's Greg Gibson is going to be here. And those of you who know Greg, Greg was one of our Christ in the Arts performers a few years back at our annual organ concert. So you will be in very good hands uh, next Sunday morning. I think that is it. Thank you all, those of you who are here, for masking and, and distancing yourself, being spaced out. Um, when I heard that during COVID we needed to space ourselves out, I said that's not a problem for me. I've been spacing out all of my adult life. So with that, let us come together and join in worshiping Almighty God. there in the sanctuary and those of you at home take a deep breath do you smell and take in that fresh new covid free air filtration system we have here in the church isn't it wonderful we're we are so happy that all of you have come the uh, sanctuary keeps getting bigger each and every sunday thank you for attending here uh, if you are able please join me in the call of worship by standing to our lord Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Come into his house with sacrifices of praise and worship. Sing to the glory of his name. For he has refined us like silver, led us through the fire and flood, and brought us out into freedom. Our lives are in your hands, O oh God. You alone keep our feet from stumbling. Let's worship God together. I sing the mighty power of God that made the 
Please join me in the prayer of confession. All merciful one, God of infinite love and compassion, though we have strayed, you have never abandoned us. We come confessing our sins and reaching out for the healing power of your forgiveness. Through Christ our Lord, give us renewed and truthful hearts that will follow you in all our ways. Amen. God listens. He hears us when we cry out to him, when we speak honestly about where we have failed. Praise God, who does not ignore our prayers or withdraw his faithful love from us. Today I want to talk to you about the armor of God, specifically the belt of truth. Back in the day, soldiers used to wear armor made of iron or steel, and it would protect them in battle. 
And the Bible says that we should put on the full armor of God, which includes the belt of truth. Now, the armor of God is not physical armor. You know, it's not made of iron or steel or definitely not cardboard like this. The armor of God is spiritual. These are dark days. And if we put on the full armor of God, we'll be able to take our stand against the devil's schemes. And you can wear truth like a belt in a suit of armor. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but a belt is a pretty important part of a soldier's armor. Yeah, and sometimes it wouldn't even just go around their waist. It'd go up on their shoulders and all over the place. It'd be this whole big harness. And almost all of the armor would connect to that harness, that belt. So if you had, if you, had you know, chest armor or you had, you had armor on your arms or on your legs, it would all connect to that harness. It would all connect to the belt. And it would help to redistribute the weight because armor was pretty heavy. And it would help everything stay in place. It was super important. And it's super important for us as Christians to wear the belt of truth to speak what is true, to stand up for what's right, to not be deceitful or tricky, and to speak the truth in love. Our integrity matters big time. You know, it's so, so important for us to share the gospel, for us to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. But if we are liars, people aren't going to believe us, even if we tell them what's true. If we lie to somebody one minute and then tell them that Jesus loves them the next minute, do you think they're going to believe us? No, they won't. Our whole message means nothing to anyone if we don't speak the truth. And sometimes it can be really, really tempting to lie. For example, if my friends came and they wanted to play soccer with me, and I asked my mom if I could go play soccer, and she said, yeah, you can go play if your room's clean. Is your room clean? If my room is not clean, but I say, yeah, it is clean, do you think my mom will go let me play? Yeah, she would, because she trusts me. But what do you think is going to happen if she finds out that my room is not clean? Yeah, big trouble for Douglas. And then next time, if my friends want to play soccer, my mom asks if my room is clean, and I say it is, do you think she's going to believe me? No. Even if it is clean, she's not going to believe me. She's going to have to go check, because I've broken that trust. So seriously, guys, it is so important for us to speak the truth, to say what is true, and to do it in love, right? Like, if you think somebody is ugly, there's no good reason to go up to that person and tell them they're ugly, even if you think it's true. That's not speaking the truth in love. God wants us to stand up for what's right, to not lie, and to speak the truth in love. So my challenge to you guys today is that you would put on the full armor of God, including the belt of truth, so that you'll be able to take your stand against the spiritual forces of evil. Hey guys, I hope you liked this video. And yeah, seriously, I hope that you will put on the belt of truth. It's so important to have truth in our lives. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through Him. So it's so important that we live in truth, the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ. Stand up for what's right, don't lie, and speak the truth in love. One of the geniuses of Douglas is that he not only speaks to the children, but he sure does speak to the adults as well, doesn't he? He has a way of crossing those age barriers, and I almost feel like um, what I'm going to say is just, um, I won't say non-essential, I don't know, icing on the cake, I hope is the way you think of it, but nonetheless... Uh, Everybody loves Douglas. I haven't heard anybody in the congregation when we introduced him when we were doing Zoom, but I appreciate Douglas. I'd like to meet Douglas someday. 
You never know, maybe we will. All right. We're uh, in a little series on the armor of God, talking today about the belt of truth, just as, uh, as Douglas was talking about a moment ago. So, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, and then another verse about truth from the Gospel of John. So listen to God's Word from Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then in the Gospel of John, when Jesus was near his time on the cross, Jesus is conversing with Pilate. And Jesus comes, tells Pilate that he has come to testify to the truth. And Pilate's response is, what is truth? Retorted Pilate, with this he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. May God bless, richly bless his word to our lives this day. A man's not feeling well, so he decides to go to the doctor, and after a physical exam and some testing, he, the doctor discusses the situation with the patient. And he says, well, you're 40 pounds overweight, you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, uh, you've got some partial heart blockages, uh, you need to quit smoking and you need to begin an exercise regimen. And after all that, the patient says, well, thanks, doc, but I think I'll go get another opinion. And he does so, and of course, the results are the same. But he decides he's just going to go home and continue living life the way he has been living it. And so the the hourglass is running out. Well, somebody's lying here. Either the doctors are lying to the patient or the patient is lying to himself. I'll leave that up to you to decide. But when it comes to health, the truth matters. When it comes to a court of law, the truth matters. When it comes to education and learning, the truth matters. When it comes to a potential marriage partner, knowing the truth about that potential partner, the truth matters. Or when it comes to making decisions, important decisions that will affect our lives, knowing the truth matters. There are times when we find out, we discover the truth, and it's often the truth about us, and it's the truth that we don't really want to hear about, and we don't really want to know. But even in those cases when we don't want to know the truth, the truth matters. Well, near the end of his earthly life, Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples. And he said to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then followed up that with a very exclusive statement. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, nobody can get to heaven if you don't go through me, through, through Jesus Christ. Well, that's a reference from John chapter 14, verse 6. And that is a reference that is on the gravestone of Billy Graham. Seems appropriate for one of the great evangelists of all times. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
That's an easy verse to know and to remember. We hear it at, at funeral services quite often. But knowing and memorizing and believing that verse can do a, a, us a great deal of good in fighting the battles of spiritual warfare. As you go through life, remember that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus has already won the war for us, but yet there are still these little battles that we have to go through on a daily basis. Some of them are small battles, and we can get through them without too much trouble, but others can be ferocious with all kinds of arrows and darts coming our way. Spiritual warfare coming from Satan himself. Like Douglas was saying in the children's message, the belt becomes the foundation for spiritual armor. The belt is the foundation for a Roman soldier. You've got to have that in place or else you've got to have that for everything else to attach to. So without the belt, you can try to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You can put on all the other pieces, but they won't stay there. If you get into a battle, they'll just all kind of fall off. But with the belt... Everything else is attached, so the soldier is well protected. And at the same time, all of these pieces of armor aren't floating and flying around that keeps him from moving around and being agile, whether he's on the offense or whether on the defense. Well, just as the belt is foundational to the armored soldier, the truth is foundational to our faith. Imagine our faith without knowing what the truth about Jesus really is. If, the, if our faith is historically true, in other words, the things that we read about in the Bible, at least that which is not stories, but the, the historical parts of the Bible, if they are true, then our faith in God is true and genuine and real, and we can count on it. Now, many have tried to disprove faith. They have set out, they have been on a mission to disprove Christianity. And after centuries, no one has been able to do that. Two of the ones that I'm most familiar with that in recent times have set out to disprove Christianity were Josh McDowell and Lee Strobel. And both of them, in their efforts to disprove Christianity, became Christians themselves. And that's kind of what happened to the Apostle Paul. He was out there persecuting all the Christians. He was trying to disprove Christianity. But yet on the road to Damascus, when the Lord spoke to him and he was blinded, he ended up becoming a Christian himself. There are people who have tried to deny the truth of Scripture, the truth of Christianity, and they have not been able to do it. Not only is our faith historically true, but because God has changed lives that gives our faith even more veracity. Many of us know how Jesus has changed our lives or how God has guided us through some difficult moments of our journey of life. Well, this passage from Ephesians is about spiritual warfare. And this is where your outline begins in the, the message this morning. Satan fights with lies that sound like truth. But the truth, as written in God's Word, as we see in Jesus Christ and as we live in truth of character, will keep us in faithful devotion to God when the flaming arrows of deception are all around us. Verse 14 says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. So how do we, as followers of Jesus in this day and age, Stand firm with that buckle of truth wrapped around our waist. First of all, we need to have a lifelong devotion to the truth. A lifelong devotion to the truth. Because truth stands the test of time. Truth, truth about God, doesn't change from one day to the next. Now, certain facts about particular situations, they can change from time to time, but truth... The truth about God never changes. It is always the same yesterday, today, and in the future. Because God is changeless then, God's word 
in Scripture is changeless as well. That's why we can rely upon the Bible. Think of all the scholars and theologians over the centuries who have spent thousands, if not millions of hours studying the Scriptures and taking it apart little piece by little piece. But yet, they've not been able to disprove Scripture. Therefore, we can trust God's Word to guide us through life. The Bible becomes then for us wisdom and truth for the ages. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we must be devoted to the truth. Pilate asked Jesus if he was king of the Jews. And he told him that he was, but he was not like an earthly king. His kingdom was not of this world, and that it was his purpose to come to earth to bring truth to the people and to the world. To which Pilate replies, what is truth? As though it were up for grabs. Pilate couldn't do anything to a guy who was claiming that he came to reveal the truth. Pilate had no authority to do anything to him, at least what those who were accusing Jesus wanted to happen to him. But the pressure from the religious community was so intense, those who were threatened by Jesus, who were not devoted to the truth of God, were instead protecting their own traditions, their own positions of power. And so when Jesus threatens their long-held ideas about what the truth was, they went on the defensive. They had to get rid of Jesus. And isn't the truth, that truth almost always the same for us? When the truth of Jesus, when the truth of Scripture begins to uncover something in our lives that we had not seen before, and usually not something that we're real proud of, we can easily go on the defensive. Because we don't want to do the hard work that it takes to truly understand what's going on in our own lives. Devotion to God's truth will mean that our understanding of God's truth may change. It may grow. It may mature over time. It's just like when we're a young child, we see the world in a particular way. But as we grow up, we begin to see the world differently. It's the same in our spiritual journey as well. So we stand firm by having a lifelong devotion to the truth. Secondly, we stand firm by avoiding, uh, avoiding truth, or understanding that avoiding truth is avoiding responsibility. Avoiding truth is avoiding responsibility. Without truth, there is no trust. Imagine friendships where there is no trust. Often it's because people have lied and deceived others into help getting them to think that I am somebody who I'm not. So without uh, truth, there is no trust. Pilate says to Jesus, what is truth anyway? Pilate did not want to take responsibility for what happened to Jesus. So he wanted others to take responsibility for him. And when that didn't work, he tried to find a way to release Jesus. And when that didn't work, he had him flogged instead of putting him to death. And when that didn't work, he appealed to the sympathy of Jesus', Jesus accusers, and that didn't work either. When it comes to the reality and the truth of who Jesus is, so often we try to wiggle our way out of it because when we realize who Jesus is, that means we need to take some responsibility for our own lives. We try everything else to find satisfaction and resolve and purpose in life, and it just doesn't happen. And in the end, when we try to substitute all kinds of other things for Jesus, we end up missing out on God's beautiful plan for our lives. And it is a beautiful plan. It may be a difficult plan, but it's beautiful in the end. So whether it is the truth about who Christ is, the truth about Scripture, the truth about ourselves, the truth about our children, the truth about our own personal finances, you and I have to take responsibility because avoiding the truth is avoiding responsibility. Ravi Zacharias, one of my favorite theologians and defenders of the faith, 
was asked one time in a forum, what are the, some of the biggest lies our culture tells us today? What are some of the biggest lies our culture tells us today? And he explains it by sharing an illustration from the life of Tiger Woods after Tiger Woods was uh, interviewed after some rehab after following the infidelity uh, with his wife. Tiger Woods said, I was living a life of a lie. I really was. And I was doing a lot of things that hurt a lot of people. So it all began when Tiger Woods was lying to himself. And Ravi Zacharias says that if he were the interviewer, he would like to follow up with another question. What did you lie to yourself about? Did you lie to yourself that you would never get caught? Or did you lie to yourself that in doing what you did, that's wherein lay your happiness? How often do we avoid the truth? Do we avoid reality? Because we think that will bring us the greatest happiness in life. And it might temporarily, but in the end, it all kind of caves in on us. There's a lot of deception going on in the world around us today. It happens within ourselves. We deceive ourselves. It's rampant in the media. It's rampant in politics, in education, in religion, and the church it gets very close. We want life to be easy, but we cannot avoid the responsibility. So often we want to make up our own truth. And there are people today who say that, well, your truth may not be my truth. And everybody can have their own truth, but that's, it doesn't work that way so easily. There's a verse in the book of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Everyone made up their own truth. They lived their own life the way they wanted to live. But that only ultimately results in chaos and destruction. Thirdly, when it comes to the belt of truth, we must have a constant source of truth available to us at all times. Have a constant source of truth available to us at all times. Jesus is the truth, the Bible says, that sets us free. What does Jesus set us free from? Jesus frees us from lies and deceptions that will lead us to spiritual death. And spiritual death keeps us from knowing and experiencing a life of joy and peace. And that comes to us because of what Jesus did on the cross and what happened at the resurrection. Chuck Swindoll, great preacher on the radio, longtime ministry, talking about spiritual warfare and the belt of truth. He says, in the heat of battle, when the flaming arrows of deception are flying around us and unjust accusations explode close enough to impact us, we need the truth of doctrine and truth of character to keep us from falling apart. This is why Paul urges us to keep that belt pulled tight, to keep the truth of God's Word close to us, to keep His incarnate truth, Jesus Himself, at the center of our lives, and to maintain our strength with unquestioned integrity. As members of Christ's army, we're to stay true to what the Bible says is right. Doing so will keep us safe from countless dangers. Along with having a constant source of truth, from time to time God reminds us, wants us to remember precisely who he is and what he did on the cross, the ramifications of the resurrection. And as the church, we gather on a regular basis to come to the table to recall, to remember the constant source of truth that we have in the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. So those of you who are here in the sanctuary, hopefully you received one of the little um, communion kits. And uh, we're going to go through all of the, the liturgy of the Lord's Supper here in a moment. Those of you who are at home, if you need to run to the kitchen and 
grab a slice of, of bread and some juice, we invite you to do so right now. So let us now come to the table of our Lord. As we come to this table, we invite all of us to come together to say together the Apostles' Creed, which affirms the common faith that we share with one another. So as we begin this time at the Lord's table, let us affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. O oh God, our Father, examine each of our hearts and our minds. May each of our hearts and minds be filled with the truth, the truth of your love, the, the truth that comes to us through the cross, the truth of scriptures, the guidance that you give to us. Purify our hearts, O God, as we come to this table, so that we might all come with clean hearts, hearts that are ready to hear and receive the message that you have for us and for the way that you seek for us to live our lives each day, so that we might be genuine witnesses for our faith, so that others who do not know your Son, Jesus Christ, might see him through our actions, and through our words. We give you thanks for the bread and the cup, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed on the cross for each one of us. Lord, so easily we take these gifts for granted, but you gave your all and sacrificed for us that we might live in eternal life with you and with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So now, Lord, we come to this table. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, and when he gathered with his disciples in the upper room, he took the bread in front of him, he blessed it, he broke it, he said, this is my body, broken for you, take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And after Jesus had taken the bread, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink it, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for and ever and ever. Amen.
Now may the living Christ go with you, before you, to show you the way, behind you, to encourage you, beside you to be your friend, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you peace. Amen.